thanks for checking out part two of the most impactful heroes of all time in Marvel Avengers Alliance. We're back here on G4G on YouTube. I'm your host, Napalm Dawn. Today's background soundtrack is brought to you by the Silent Hill 2 OST. And it's rather unique music that you can pick out just about anywhere. So, resuming where we left off. We left off on page 10, so we're going to pick up here on page 11 today. So, we're going to start off with Doctor Doom. Doctor Doom was the first hero slash villain of his kind. He was the first one that could only get teamed with the agent. And we know, of course, the only other one that can currently do this is Kang. Doctor Doom has pretty much long been forgotten in PvP. But he was extremely solid when he came out. He was featured on a lot of defensive teams and he was used quite effectively on offense. His ability to restore stamina to the team, heal the team, do summons that set him up for all crazy follow-ups right after that. He was really solid. The Doom Cannon was always a little underwhelming for the amount of effort you put into getting it. But, Doom was pretty strong. There's nothing particularly stopping Doom from being relevant now, as his Ring Imperial is just a, pretty much the same as going up against a Kurth without the reduction of damage. Unfortunately, with the way stats are going nowadays, Doom just really can't stand up to it anymore. When I do run into Dooms from time to time in PvP, he has about the same amount of hit points as the Agent. So that really kind of means that he's worthless. Also, now with Tacticians being level 15, they are guaranteed two turns no matter what. So in reality, Dr. Doom just doesn't bring that much to the table anymore. That being said, with the hit to Magic Warding, there is nothing saying that some of his level 2 isn't bad anymore. I mean, he could be solid and he could probably be kitted out with some nice ISOs and everything like that. But Doom has pretty much disappeared from the meta, despite the fact that around the Christmas in which he was released, he was extremely strong. Nico was one of the uh, all-important blasters that was around. She was definitely a solid blaster in the face of the rise of tacticians and she went very very strongly with Pesty at the time. During the Horsemen of Apocalypse spec ops that we dealt with, Nico, Pesty, and the Four Horsemen set were absolutely huge in PvP. With Nico's resing, which was really the first of its kind, that it was a guarantee and not a hit or miss thing like Valkyrie or Phoenix, Nico was extremely strong. Now, she always had low health, but there were ways of augmenting that, and in reality, with her coming back, she basically was two heroes in one. The really bad thing that suffered from her uh, is her staff of one. When you go deep into a battle, it's almost impossible to remember what things you have and haven't used but her more dots more dots more dots more dots okay stop dots and then rock and roll were really really big at the time also under her lesser arcana stick around was absolutely huge at the time too this is back when we were still dealing with lots of deadpools and quick jugs and stick around if done before deadpool's first turn would actually make him pass. It goes to show you how single-minded Deadpool is when controlled by the AI, that if you stop him from using his melee base level 1, he simply says fuck you and stops. He doesn't even try to do anything else. Iceman, when he came out, was fairly popular. Not so much in his stock suit, but in his 2-4 horseman suit. Uh, he was used fairly frequently. Here's another one, again, who really has a chance to make a good showing in PvP now. He has a Blaster Alt, which can be used for Fatal Finish. He does provide Fatal Blow, and he also provides Doom and Despair. Now that Magic Warding, again, has taken the hit that it did, there's nothing stopping uh, Iceman from being relevant. It's really kind of a shame what the Marvel Universe has done to his character lately, making him gay. 
Not that I have an issue with that, it's the fact that they have taken one of the most notorious womanizers of all time and done that. <sighs> this could be another swipe uh, at the mutant side from the other side of the Marvel Universe, but hopefully our beloved Bobby over here does not become the horseman of fashion. I know. I'm only kidding. Hogun and Fandril, Warriors 3. Now, Hogun is extremely powerful in PvE. He's never really shown up in PvP the way Fandril and Volstagg did. But Hogun is an absolute beast and he is my favorite scrapper carry for the simulators. He also has shown up on just about every group boss that I've used uh, him with in a long, long time. His setup is fantastic, and his overwhelming presence with his personal AI so is glorious. You could make the case that nowadays this is a good one to slop Despair or the Pesty one onto, but his personal AI so is just so good, you really can't screw with it. His ability to ramp up Scrapper-related ISOs on his wind-up swing and his counter bow shot and then finish things off with a massive meteor smash. Hogun is one of the best scrappers of all time. Do not ever overlook him. Fandral was a complete douche when he was first released. He was often teamed up with Anti-Venom and Pesty. Even if he wasn't teamed up with Pesty, there was nothing more annoying than cleaning off bleeds from Flinning Circus only to have him drop another three on you the next turn. Once something got you ravaged, you were absolutely taking huge amounts of damage from this. Technically, it's a misnomer to say that a fencing shot is slashing in melee. Uh, a saber is poked, not slashed, because the sharpest point of this is at the tip. It's not a regular sword that has a sharp edge. But okay, we're just playing petty anti shit over here to say that. He was very good and will remain a strong infiltrator for all time. He can be equipped with infiltrator ISO, so he is definitely a good candidate for the covert ISO. He's really, really disappeared, but he's one of those ones that could absolutely be pretty strong if he were to come back. His on guard is a buff and his D power was very strong at the time. It was ridiculously strong. But once Deep Power took a nerf, Fangel's popularity, which had already waned, is just became abysmal. Volstag was often teamed up with Fandral and the Warriors 3 tanker that the agent could use. This was a very strong force as Volstag did do bleeds like Fandral and he really liked to work with bleeds, especially on the Axarang. Axarang is a huge destructive force of nature, especially if there are some pressure points out. Fandral could do those. And, uh, yeah, so the Warriors 3 was very, very popular at the time and very tough to deal with on defense. Now that we can deal with level 15 versions of them and they can activate one of two class types, the Warriors 3 are still really strong, they're just not used. However, with a bunch of the tanking-related ISOs that are out there, Volstagg could definitely become a force again as a nice tank for a team. He, like some other Warriors 3, suffers from having very good personal ISOs, so it's kind of tough to give him generic ones. Big Breakfast is big because it sets him up to do a Super Axe Rang very, very early on. Voracious is pretty solid, but this is probably the one that you could replace with other bruiser related ISOs. Guard the rear can be equipped with some of the new protect ones and he also has an A ISO for his elixir of recovery. Falcon, believe it or not, not that you would know it at this time, but Falcon was very popular in PvP for a while. He was one of the first people to give your team uh, survival training, which made it ridiculously tough to start taking teams down. The first round you were basically chipping. I mean it was a putt in terms of damage. After you got below that 80% though you could finally start unloading. He was also part of team shutdown with rescue just like Omega Sentinel was. Very good on defense not really always for the win 
just to make it really, really obnoxious to take them down. He does have some uh, ISOs out there, but Falcon has just kind of been written off and he's never been that strong. Rocket Raccoon was an absolute game changer when it came to his ability to add on to people's counters and follow-ups. He's still quite relevant today. It's easy to equip him with Fatal Finish if you use him in his default suit, and his ability to lay damage has only gotten increased with the advent of some of the new energy-related ISOs out there. He comes in two different blaster forms and a generalist form which does get rid of his weakness. The Generalist Movie Coon is the best thing ever for him because you don't suffer the blaster negative effect and you still do get guaranteed crits for him. It says successful attacks by the Guardians of the Galaxy are guaranteed to be critical hits. Well, he counts as that. So why make him a blaster? Well, the only reason now is like Fatal Finish and or Phase Frequencies. But Rocket has definitely been somebody who has not dipped. He's got a lot of competition in the aggressive field now, though, with Spitfire. Gamora was an absolute pain in the ass when she came out. Originally, classic Gamora wasn't used too much, and her master, Assassin Proc, was notorious for basically showing up never. However, as time wore on and we got the movie suit, she definitely became tough to deal with. That first round cower and despair made you absolutely put your head in your hands and just yell, <sighs> shit. Well, she disappeared for a long time, but again, this is another one who could make a comeback thanks to the fact that she has built-in despair. She also has Doom guaranteed on her level 1 and possibly on her level 2, and the AI does effectively use her execute. It's rare to see the AI use Gamora's execute unless she knows she's going to kill somebody. Sandman was somebody who we always expected to show up but never really did. He actually is still a very good tank when used in the hands of a human, but he's kind of a little poor on defense. He is immune to attrition, which means we might see the rise of Sandman if the last PvP blade winds up taking off. He's going to be one of the only things that can stand up to it. He, along with Heimdall, is another one that gets huge, huge hits when Finest Hour is built up properly, and he generates that himself. His Sand Spikes is a huge hit for AoE, and his Hammering Blow is one of the strongest hits in the game. Anti-Venom was a nightmare if you saw him with PvP and Pesty. You went, oh no. Every time you got into combat and you saw him team up with Pesty, you just prayed to whatever was your deity of choice that I Am The Cure was not the opening round. Or if you had the Mystic Shroud, you really hoped that it did then and there while you were protected for it. This, of course, was back in the day when Deep Power was considerably more vicious than it is now, as it affected every action for an entire round, including heals and cleanses. You couldn't do anything other than deal direct damage. Nowadays, Deep Power has been nerfed into the ground and sucks, and we probably won't see Anti-Venom that much ever again. His Crusade, though, was a huge hit, and his Cleansing Touch was the first of its kind. It's now been recalled, or renamed, to be Purged, but it definitely had a different name at the time. It was also used to cheese a little bit of a bug in Playdom's code. If you cleansing touch somebody who had Doom on them, or genetically altered, it was considered a removal effect, and you would cause Doom or genetically altered to proc right then and there. So before Demise ever came out, and mind you, Demise came out a long time after Doom came out, you could Doom somebody, like from a Mortal Strike on Gamora, and then Cleansing touch them, and you would force Doom to proc. Drax had a short-lived time where he was pretty effective in PvP. He's kind of faded, although Movie Drax is causing Star-Lord to cause hemorrhaging on all his attacks, and that's pretty vicious. Really good for bleeder teams, but Drax has largely all but disappeared as everything banked on his cry for blood and the moment you so much as sneeze on him, 
there it goes. Groot was definitely a major bruiser in PvP for a long time. Once we got Movie Groot and his inability to get Fatal Blowed, and all of the buffs and everything that he brought, oh my god. It was very, very tough to deal with the Guardians teams whenever Groot was around. He's really faded out mostly because he's so heavily melee based and when he runs into a Hoogan's Eye team and now the Drain teams, he's just not really that good. But he's another one who definitely could still be a reasonable tank. Star-Lord, he's one of these guys who's gone through two very big periods in his history. Originally, Movie Lord, which was his second suit in all actuality. Uh, actually, no, I take that back. Movie Star-Lord was the original suit and he was actually the only Guardians of the Galaxy where the movie suit was the default. Everybody else, it was a comic suit and then they got a movie suit, but... The timing of Star-Lord's release, he actually released around the time of the movie and came with the movie suit caked in. He is an extremely solid character that really loves the hair trigger ISO because you could do trick shot at Quantum Leap and follow up with Spray and Pray which buffs the team. Quantum Leap is stealthy so it's a very easy thing to get around protectors. Star-Lord is still very much in the meta nowadays thanks to Spitfire dragging Star-Lord back out. We don't really see his movie suit anymore, but there's nothing stopping him from coming back, especially with the Covert ISO and the Hair Trigger ISO. But basically, uh, Big O over here, the Big O outfit is very different from the movie suit and it kind of changes the setup of Star-Lord. Gorgon, along with Shitterstar, is one of the few people in the game whose counter or follow-up is an AoE, and is definitely something that can be abused. Hit somebody with a flank, and you hit him with Feel the Thunder, and then you follow up with Dance of Death. Now that we have Shocker, there is again nothing stopping Gorgon from coming back and being teared up with a ground team. There's also lots of good ground-related ISOs now, that could make Gorgon relevant again. Because a lot of his attacks are ground and not melee, he's not going to proc drain attacks, but two of them are melee. Morbius is somebody who we might start seeing in PvP once people start getting his ISOs, like I recently did. Which I'm going to equip so I don't forget it. He's got one of the fun heroics that's out now, and it's the one with Blade. He is a huge Delirium exploiter, and as Delirium effects like Cloak and Dagger and other people get more and more popular, we definitely might see a little bit more Morbius. Believe it or not, Morbius carries his heroic battle with Blade, especially if he's 15 and you equip him with the Covert ISO. Fixer is one of those rare people that has done very, very, very well against group bosses. And he's a little awkward in PvP. You can't trust him on defense, although people try. But because he's a blaster at heart, there's nothing stopping him from switching to Tactician and getting tactical bonuses in the first turn. He's one of a few people that can do this along with Omega Sentinel. Fixer has been a group boss killer. He was so good that Kingpin was buffed to work against Victor, Fixer. However, Kingpin was the last of the group bosses to really be anti-Fixer. And he is now back in form and doing bang-up jobs against group bosses. Molly Hayes was an absolute wrecker in PvP when she was popular. She was often teamed up with Invisible Woman with air pressure to keep debuffs off her. This ensured that Molly, Power Princess over here, could do exactly what you wanted her to do. She's got some wonderful personal ISOs that stop her from falling asleep after a tantrum and sweet candy. There is a video up on my YouTube of Molly eating candy two back-to-back -back turns literally saving a match. Her candy saved a near loss for me against a pesty team. 
She was extremely popular for me uh, back in the day on offense, and I even teamed her up with Null on defense, and they won for a long time. Unfortunately, the stamina nerf came into effect, and it means that Molly's tantrum isn't what it used to be. She was also an incredibly good group boss killer if you got the boss flanked, because you would always hit him with drop kick, which set up combo setup, and then wind up punch exploited it as the follow up flanked hit. So you just used the relatively low stamina drop kick and got a free wind up punch right afterwards. We're probably never really going to see Molly in PvP again, which is really sad because she is a beast. Hybrid enjoyed a little bit of popularity with Anti-Venom and Pesty. He's another one who stands to make a slight comeback thanks to the triple blaster and double blaster blowups. However, in reality, his bruiser suit is actually one of the better ones, but the blaster suit is considered the stock and is the only one that can use double ISOs. Beta Ray Bill is single-handedly responsible for creating the electric meta, along with his buddy, Victor down there, part of the Runaways. Thorse, as I like to call him, Thorhorse, is definitely a force. Playdom has given us the shock foil isos, but to use those now in combat on the rare event that you actually run into an electrical team, probably not worth it. His thunder rolls is probably one of the single most biggest bullshit e isos in the entire game. There is nothing like being shielded and taking no damage from the actual, I say the nay, initial attack. But then watching thunder rolls and static charge proc and take your team down to about half health. Leaves you bashing your head against the desk and just hoping that Playnom does something about it. Well, they gave you the shock foil ISO, so you can always try it. And, you know, he's pretty strong. He does suffer a little bit from melee drains thanks to Stormbreaker. But he is really, really solid and there is definitely a place for him now, especially with Electro. Lots of people were using him with Electro for a period of time when the hammer was bugged. He can't use Blaster Isos, which saves him from being part of Fatal Finish teams, but he definitely makes good use of a lot of Bruiser Isos. Get his personal Iso though if you can. Destroyer was somebody that was very, very unique at the time. We kind of hoped he would show up in PvP thanks to his severe... Uh, debuff immunities, but unfortunately he never really has. He does get teamed up sometimes with Victor for uh, energy related shenanigans and he takes really really well to the rectifier. Again, if the new PvP blade takes off, we might see some more destroyers out there simply because of his immunity to lots of dot effects and delirium effects and psychic effects. Victor I've never been a big fan of him in PvP, but he is definitely a pain in the ass infiltrator to deal with. His ability to shield himself, shut down tacticians, and just wreak general havoc made him a very annoying infiltrator. Before they quote unquote fixed his resurrection, if you didn't have a fatal blow, you were in for a potential 20 to 40 minute match with this dude because he would reboot like crazy. You couldn't really ever get a feel if his reboot gave him the immune turn like you get with Nico, because he was rebooting so fucking frequently, you couldn't really ever tell. Fortunately, Playdom says that they fixed it, but some people are still saying that they are getting into reboot loops with Victor. This page over here, page 16, is kind of weak for the impact. But Deathlock has been making a bit of a name for himself with a lot of ISOs that have made him pretty popular. He can make some good use of the triggered ISO because his level 1 counts as a single target gun. And the Deb kind of shuts him down. However, he comes now with this big suppression grenade that becomes an, an AOE exhausted and neutralized. And now his biotech launcher causes despair. Playdom probably said, oh, we'll give him Despair to help you out with all those healers, like when Colossus was popular. But now, Playdom has created a monster because he could definitely do Despair and be part of Blaster Blowup. 
Look for Deathlock to get a little bit more popular if Blaster Blowup continues in its current form. Spider-Man Noir along with Rocket Raccoon is one of the best counter slash follow up people. He dislikes stealth so much he pops stealthy people like crazy. And to that effect it actually helps him run, uh, be strong against counter teams. Counter teams are usually using stealth to hit the people that they want like angrier and get around protectors. And Spider-Man Noir really hates stealth and he'll shoot you for it strongly if you go in on him with stealth attacks it makes him kind of a bitch to deal with he is a little squishy he's not the squishiest guy out there but he definitely makes a major impact for the spitfire union jack quicksilver rocket raccoon type teams hyperion really shook the foundation of what we expect from heroes in this game because he got an alt suit that actually has two isos He's got an alt suit that has two ISOs that always protects. So Hyperion was definitely set up to be an extremely good tank in PvP. Mostly because he doesn't really do anything wrong in the hands of the AI. You could say a human would do things maybe in a better order, but honestly the AI really can't fuck him up. Unfortunately, people started running blasters, which really kind of killed Hyperion. He does come in a generalist form, which means he has no weaknesses, but the problem is there's not really good generalist isos for him. Hyperion still is a tank in the mid to lower levels of PvP, and a lot of people did say that when he got going and leveling, he was kind of fun. ASG or ASW, or as I like to say, Spider Tits, definitely made a splash when she was released. She was extremely strong. She liked to get, she, she may as well have almost been a tactician with the way that she got extra turns. Unfortunately, Playdom went in and nerf batted her really, really quickly. In an odd twist, Playdom went after her fairly quickly after she was released. First, she got, well not first, she got a cooldown on impact webbing. Web slingshot was the only thing she was left with. Magnetic maneuver, now while being stealthy, isn't subtle, so it procs tacticians. What I never understood is that my ASG blaster would proc enemy tacticians, but anytime ASG went, my tactician was never procced. Never understood that. She was really strong with me with Iron Fist for a long time. Iron Fist provided the support. She provided the knockout. She also took a definite hit to her splashing of webbing. The chance to apply web to all really, really, really shrank. And she's just not where she should be now. A lot of people thought Silk was going to materialize when it came to PvP because of her spinning silk and the chance to apply up to three webs i wanted to run a silk team and an infiltrator black suit spider-man team with the covert iso but it just never really materialized silk is still one of the more fun generalists out there mordo is enjoying a little bit of popularity now thanks to his ability to get phased cause despair and also be part of blaster blow up he definitely can be a particularly strong character as he was definitely taking use of straining right around the time that uh stamina got nerfed he's not really shown up too much but as more and more attrition teams might show up out there or run blaster blow up mordo can definitely be a major annoyance Spitfire has been one of Playdom's strongest releases in a long time. She's really good in the Scrapper Sims. She's really good in PvE, especially when you know what ISIS to give her. And she is a force to be reckoned with in PvP. Both on offense in the hands of a human and AI controlled. She's been notorious for setting up Blade, where her and Blade take the first four actions of combat. She's really annoying to take down because if you Nano Plague her, her own self-healing pushes Nano Plague off the table and she can start regaining buffs. Honestly, Exhausted is one of the best things you can do to shut down Spitfire 
but she is really strong when handled properly with ISOs and the right armory backup. Elsa had a moment in the sun on offense for a little while, thanks to Haith giving her good protection and her being the really big bruiser killer for a while. Sadly, the Deb came and shot her down for a little while, and that was a pain in the ass. The way to counter that is to just make all of her magic stealthy. I used her for a long time until I got really tired of magic warding messing up my soul fire removing buffs, so I switched over to Archangel and used Nanoplague Plague to do it. She enjoyed a tiny bit of a comeback on defense when people were running her as part of Blaster Blowup. Howard the Duck was somebody we didn't have the highest amount of hopes for and actually turned out to be pretty fun. He is the ultimate support tactician. You can bring him into combat and almost have him take the place of the agent thanks to Fury's Closet. He's really good and you actually can't underestimate his Quack Fu Eat My Glove combos when set up properly. He's really really good and he also is pretty handy in Tactician Sims. A lot of people have used Winter Soldier in PvP. People had hopes for him to be good. They were like, ooh, the mines and the blow-ups, and it'll be good and magnetized. He got a start, he got his foot in the door, but then the Deb really shut things down because they were messing with his mine usage. Now that the Deb can't hit subtle actions, Winter Soldier is making a slight comeback and does definitely appear in mid to low tier PvP. He's kind of fun in PvE and might make a good showing on some future group bosses with the mines and blowing them up. Electro is definitely one of the best blasters Playdom has released in a while. If you have never ramped up Electro's damage just to see it at its fullest, it is a thing of beauty. He also now as you've discovered on my channel, is really good for setting up the, the enemy team to be giant Pikachus and then equipping your team to counter it. Electro has the ability to say, hey, enemies, everything you do is basically class wiped out, but you're also electric type people. So if you set your team up to counter or absorb electric items, Electro is a huge setup for it. It's a really good thing that we got the classic Spider-Man villain suit and not the Jamie Foxx one or the one that makes an appearance in Marvel Contest of Champions. That one's just really, really weird. Cammy has been one of those heroes that everybody poo-pooed on for a while, including myself, but once you started devoting some time into her, she got a lot better. She also really likes the Rectifier. And her ability to restore stamina to the team every single turn if you set her up right, she makes her pretty good. She actually holds her own in PvE now, and you should see the damage she could do when Satana's on the field with her. PvP, not so much, but I can see some people making good teams with her on offense. Cloak and Dagger. Our most recent PvP hero at the filming of this particular episode here. She is going to be strong. I know a lot of people in several of the groups I'm in that have been bringing her into practice battles way not level 15. And they said she is kicking ass. First of all, being an infiltrator, she it's weird. She uses infiltrator isos, but she goes to the scrapper sim. If you look at her equip, and we go over to class restricted. She uses infiltrator isos, which means she could possibly show up with the covert iso. If that happens, she's going to be knocking down your damage on counter attacks, and she's going to be generalizing you. That's a scary thing to deal with. We don't often have to deal with that other than infiltrator pesty beast. The thing is, hers is more than just generalized, it's purged. It hurts you if you try to clean it, and it gives her rising up. That makes her counter slash follow up hit really, really vicious. She's going to suffer against the popularity of bruisers, but hey, she has the ability to turn bruisers off, and she doesn't have melee attacks, which means she's going to laugh at a lot of bruiser tanks. 
There are reports coming in that she can actually clean you in the face of Manipulated and Paradise Lost, and she also can heal through Despair. She has a huge potential to turn the meta on its head, and we might be seeing a new major shift in the paradigm of things. Rounding out this video, we have Shocker and Deathlocket. We don't really know how these two are going to wind up so much. I don't have Shocker set up to do massive damage. I keep trying. He does okay. The fact that he's Sonic and Ground means he does have a limited pool that can go with, but the people who synergize with him absolutely synergize with him. I've heard some people use decent Shocker and Electro teams, and it certainly could work for Blaster Blow Up. Death Locket can't really say much on her at the time. She's probably one of the most confusing heroes to use. And I don't really know that we'll see her in PvE, or rather PvP that much. She also, in case you've never heard me discuss it, has a bug sprite. On her icon over here, and her profile pic over here, her cybernetic stuff is on the left side of her, but her model over here, it's on the right. Supposedly Playdom has said that they will fix this, but this is a little bit more attractive than to look at this abomination over here. So that's it guys, that is part two of the top most impactful heroes of all time. As I said in video one, most of this is judged on their PvP performance, because that is probably where you can actually get more of a good ranking system for these people. But there are people who are known for doing phenomenally well in PvE. That would be people like Pepsi just sweeping through missions, Havoc exhausting everybody and setting up big pressure points, the famous group boss killers of Iron Fist, Iron Man, Molly, Hogan, uh, mind blow ups from Fixer and Winter Soldier doing huge amounts of damage. Satana as the ultimate setup chick for everybody making them super more powerful. Um, it's going to be interesting to see who becomes major players after this point. As I just said, it seems like Cloak and Dagger has that chance. I don't know if she'll be a major factor in PvE, but people are already discussing her impact on PvP. And as I said, the, it's kind of, the jury's a little out on Shocker and Death Locket and how those two will show up. So guys, I hope you enjoyed the video series here. I'm thinking of doing a individual set of like top blasters and bruisers, but I think that might actually be a little bit repetitive for these two videos. But if you want to see me discuss something like that, especially if isolated to PvP scenarios, let me know down in the comments below and I'll think about doing a series on that. Thanks guys, hope you enjoyed the video. See ya.